Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Marjorie, for that kind welcome and for the wonderful work that you and the AITSUL team have done in developing this network, in pursuing the ambitions that we as a government have for the nation around the enhanced quality of the teaching profession and enhanced recognition of the quality of the nation's teaching profession. Uh, it really is an exceptional effort uh, from the AITSUL team and wonderful to see such a gathering of people here today for this very important event and couple of days of discussion that you're all participating in. Uh, can I commence by acknowledging uh, the Ghana people whose traditional lands here of the Adelaide Plains we meet on and as the nation's education minister uh, particularly acknowledge uh, the knowledge and learnings of all Australia's traditional owners about which we continue to learn much more and from which we continue to build our knowledge upon. I start by thanking all of you, not just for being here today as participants uh, in this important event, but also importantly as teachers. As teachers, not just for the work you do in your schools, in your classrooms, with your students, but frankly for uh, the relief that uh, you as a collective help to give me from time to time. As the nation's education minister, it's easy to find yourself often bogged down by policy debates, political arguments, funding disputes from time to time. And the way that you lift yourself out of those as the nation's education minister is to go and visit an early learning centre and, uh, and see some exceptional activities happening there or one of our nation's fine research institutes and have my mind boggled by researchers speaking about concepts that I can barely comprehend or indeed visit uh, any number of schools where there are teachers doing incredible things uh, to try to help transform the lives of those students. So thank you uh, from me uh, for helping to make uh, my job that much more bearable uh, when the politics of it all sometimes leave you questioning the wisdom of it all because it is importantly what you do that makes the difference on the ground. Thank you also for the opportunity to be here to launch uh, this network event. A summit of dedicated teachers who have volunteered and successfully completed the highly accomplished and lead stages of the Australian Professional Standards for Teaching process. This is an opportunity to not only learn from each other, to celebrate such excellence and your personal achievements, but also, as you heard from Marjorie, to further promote Holt to the rest of the profession and to cement its place in our future education landscape. The Aitzel Board approved the establishment of the highly accomplished and lead teachers network for these purposes. And AITSL, as I said in the introduction, has done a marvellous job bringing us this far, but it will now be working with all of you. That takes this to the next step and beyond. I want to particularly acknowledge the principals who are here today, who have championed their teachers on this journey and supported them in this learning pathway. And of course, I want to congratulate the expert teacher practitioners whose own commitment to self-improvement will strengthen the teaching profession. I understand that it is a rigorous and challenging journey you have all been through. After initially meeting the high eligibility requirements, including collecting evidence and being subject to classroom observations and further assessment. I admire the perseverance and obviously, with some 3,000 plus hours of teaching experience in the room, of which when we got to my table, I contributed a big fat zero uh, to, the, uh, to the total. It's a demonstration uh, of, of course, the collective knowledge and practical experience that we have here. That you're all doing this voluntarily with limited rewards, depending on the jurisdiction you're from, deserves even greater admiration. By volunteering to certify as an expert in the practice of classroom teaching, you not only demonstrate your, your passion for your vocation, but you also raise community respect for teaching. Your role is to support your peers now to become better at their job. Your support is specific in some ways to engage in reflective practice, to assist others to study their own methods of instruction and assessment and share their experience with their colleagues. Your role in helping your peers to make these behaviours a more regular, routine part of their professional lives. Those of you who are now formally recognised as expert practitioners, 
will make a significant difference to the job satisfaction of your colleagues and ultimately, we hope, to the learning experience of their students. The question we must all ask ourselves at the outset of a process like this is, why the certification process? Why was this established? Why do we need it? I'm happy to acknowledge that the certification process was developed in 2012 by the previous government and endorsed by all education ministers of all political persuasions. We continue to support HALT, as we do AITSL, but we do want to make it work better, and hence our support for the initiative to develop this network gathering. The reasons for wanting to enhance it are clear, as I'll outline shortly, and as everyone in this room well appreciates. Teacher quality is the most important in-school factor in driving student performance. We also know from our own experiences, and given that there are some 260,000 plus teachers across all levels and sectors, that not all teachers are the same in terms of capacity and impact on student outcomes. That is as it is in any profession. But there are two challenges for both those who supply teachers, our universities and other teacher training providers, and those who employ them, our education departments, authorities and schools. First, there is the challenge of identifying what academic skills and personal attributes make a great teacher and how this should affect the selection of those who want to become teachers and what should be in the courses they study to become teachers. Second, there is the challenge of identifying from the thousands of teachers already in the field, those who are outstanding. What is it that makes them so effective as teachers? How their experiences can be replicated and how such behaviour can be recognised, rewarded and encouraged. The Turnbull government is seeking to address the first, the issue of what makes a great teacher and how they are trained, through our Teacher Education Ministerial Advisory Group Review, which Marjorie mentioned, the TMAG report, which I will highlight shortly. Because as a federal government, we have a major role in funding, the primary role, in fact, in funding initial teacher education through the funds we provide to universities and other teaching providers in the order of some $600 million per annum. But of course, the corollary of that is that the Commonwealth does not run schools or employ teachers. So how we address the second challenge of identification in schools and championing in schools is more problematic. Our levers are somewhat more limited and of course does require particular cooperation with state governments and non-government school authorities. Trying to assess individual teacher performance by assessing student outcomes based on a national testing regime designed to help teachers is not desirable. Previous Commonwealth attempts to introduce performance pay for teachers have encountered obvious problems. Other countries have experimented with such measures with often indeterminate results. Too often a sense the cart has been put before the horse of looking at remuneration being introduced first as an incentive to increase performance rather than identifying who the great teachers are and then assessing how they should possibly be rewarded. Over the years, the states and territories in the non-government sector have developed a range of different mechanisms to try to recognise teachers with advanced skills and with mixed success. Because of these difficulties, I see tremendous opportunities for the certification of highly accomplished and lead teachers program as a national process, but with the state and territory certifiers which AITSL has developed as being a great way forward. And the development of the network, which we are launching today, is certainly another step in the right direction. The network will leverage your collective expertise. Your work will garner respect and hopefully entice your colleagues to pursue certification. In recognition of the teaching expertise acquired through the certification process, it is now linked to pay increments for teachers in New South Wales and the ACT, the government sector in the Northern Territory and the Catholic sector in South Australia. I was pleased to note in the local media today that the South Australian government is also creating highly accomplished and lead teacher positions under their new industrial award. I would not be surprised, in fact would hope, that this recognition is embraced more broadly in the future. And I understand that other teacher employers are considering providing increments or allowances 
to certified teachers to reward their commitment, expertise and additional contribution. I think the network is best placed to support and mentor new teachers as they journey into the classrooms for their teaching careers. Because we all know that the research is very clear. Effective induction is critical if new teachers are to successfully transition from their formal training into full-time classroom teaching. New teachers need structured mentoring, observation and feedback. Again, the evidence is clear. A good, effective induction is what will keep them dedicated to their profession. And a contented, motivated teacher, of course, provides optimal outcomes for student learning. I encourage you to commit to the network in the same way you have committed to becoming highly accomplished and lead teachers. And I'm confident of your commitment because it's evidenced by your attendance here today. Of course, remember as you do so that you are a collective of expert practitioners with the capacity to raise the quality of teaching. Developing pre-service and beginning teachers makes you their supervisors, mentors and leaders. They will look to you for guidance, support and approval. Your new status gives you great responsibility, but of course, the fact that you are so accomplished yourselves demonstrates you are up to the task. The summit's themes are to celebrate, commit, collaborate and champion as we've heard, and they nicely encapsulate the pathway forward. You are celebrating not just a personal milestone for your selection as a highly accomplished teacher, but it is also a milestone for the teaching profession because it is highlighting the value and need for teachers with outstanding skills. Coming together over two days is your chance to meet and support each other, to commit to the network and to work towards the goal of improving teacher quality across Australia. I look at the program for the network and in particular the provocations that are being set uh, for each of you, uh, which I think about my day-to-day -day job and it seems as if everybody is, uh, is frequently seeking to provoke me or set a provocation. But I'm delighted to see such a structured approach to provocations occurring over these couple of days that hopefully will give uh, a far more, uh, far more effective outcome than perhaps political provocations usually provide. The network, the certification process has the Turnbull government's strongest possible support. I want to briefly highlight some of our other initiatives that are, in, that are impacting upon your profession. The TMAG report, which we've spoken of a couple of times already today. Because improving teacher quality is so important and is a key pillar of our Students First policy, we undertook the TMAG report to give a short but effective recommendations and advice on how best to improve teacher quality. The government has accepted all but one of those 38 recommendations. We determined the TMAG report will not go the way of the other 101 reviews that have occurred into teacher education. All those recommendations that we have accepted will be implemented or on the way to implementation by next year, by 2017. We're providing the funding of $16 million to enable AITSUL to oversee that implementation. Professor Hattie and Marjorie, working closely with my department, with my office, and with the states and territories and non-government school providers to ensure this is one teacher education report that will not languish. And because of this commitment, we are seeing real success. Last December, all education ministers agreed to revised and strengthened accreditation standards for initial teacher education programs, as well as a revised accreditation process and timetable. The new standards and accreditation will bring rigour and consistency to initial teacher programs. Closely aligned with the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers, the new accreditation standards involve requirements on selecting entrance to teacher education and the use of the National Literacy and Numeracy Test. New requirements for all primary teaching students to complete a subject specialisation. More focus on building partnerships between initial teacher education providers and schools to provide enhanced professional experience. A final year classroom teaching performance assessment to prove graduates meet the graduate career stage of the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers and requirements for providers to demonstrate the impact of their programs on pre-service teacher performance and ultimately on the new teacher's impact on their students. 
These changes mean that graduate teachers will now study a quality teacher education program that meets the revised accreditation standards. It means we should be certain that before teachers enter a classroom, having left university, they are sufficiently prepared to make an immediate impact on student learning. AITSIL is progressing four other recommendations of the TMAG report. Developing national guidelines for beginning teacher induction to ensure some consistent implementation of effective induction programs. Implementation of a national initial teacher education and teacher workforce data strategy to evaluate the programs and inform workforce planning in the future. Instigating a national research agenda to identify effective teacher practices and encourage their dissemination and take up right through the early stages of training. And reviewing the graduate career stage of the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers to see if we need to invest more to guarantee the new evidence requirements are properly implemented in that graduate stage. Over time, these reforms will see new teachers moving into our classrooms who should be better prepared for the day-to-day -day realities of working in our schools. You should also see changes in the pre-service teachers coming through to work alongside of you. As you know, professional experience placements are critical to developing each and every new teacher. Dedicated, committed and accomplished teachers will help governments to raise the status of what is one of our most important professions. Key to lifting the quality of teacher education is making sure that graduating teachers have strong personal skills, including in literacy and numeracy. This year we will be introducing the literacy and numeracy test for initial teacher education students. This nationally consistent literacy and numeracy test will give employers and the community confidence that our teachers' personal skills qualify them for the authority they hold in classrooms. Students completing initial teacher education courses from 1 July 2016 will be expected to pass this national test. Last year, up to 5,000 students sat the test voluntarily as part of a trial. And we saw in the national average 92% passing the literacy component and 90.5% passing the numeracy component. The Australian Council for Educational Research will administer the test right around the Australia to provide that uniformity. Students will sit the test through a mix of physical testing centres and online de delivery. Last week I announced the test is being offered this semester. This is a very tangible response to public concerns about the quality of some of our latest graduate teachers. It also should raise confidence in the effectiveness of existing programs to prepare teachers for their role of teaching literacy and numeracy to students. I do want to take this opportunity, as I've done already, to particularly acknowledge how well AITSL has progressed, excellence in teaching and school leadership on behalf of the government. AITSL has built a solid reputation in the profession and worked hard to garner ongoing support of states, territories and other stakeholders, especially to take up the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers. The standards have been officially in place since 2011 and jurisdictions have embedded them in a variety of ways. I'm pleased that a growing number of teachers and school leaders plan to use the standards even more to improve their professional practice. As you know, the standards are a public statement of what constitutes teacher quality. They define what teachers should know and be able to do at different stages in their careers. The benchmarks are graduate, proficient, highly accomplished and lead. They underpin national approaches to the accreditation of initial teacher education programs, the registration of teachers and the formal delivery of highly accomplished and lead teachers. The standards have made it possible to formally recognise expertise. There is now public and professional recognition for those teachers, like those of you gathered here, who can demonstrate the expertise and skill to certify against the standards. Leadership and school autonomy are other pillars of the government's student first policy. And again, research is clear. Leadership, effective leadership, informed leadership, knowledgeable leadership, combined with a degree of school autonomy, is second only to that quality of teaching when it comes to students' learning and in-school factors that influence it. We know that school leaders improve student outcomes 
They attract good teachers. They motivate teachers and influence the school environment. They engage with their local communities. The government has funded AITSUL to develop the Australian professional standard for principals. It sets out what principals are expected to know, understand and do and to achieve in their work. The standard is a tool to build the quality and capacity of our principals. It is also there to help parents to understand the scope and complexity of a principal's work. AITSUL has developed the leadership profiles which build on the standard by describing leadership practices. The profiles are a comprehensive developmental framework and shared understanding of highly effective school leadership in all its forms. Our support for AITSUL's work on school leadership and working with the states and territories, professional principal associations and all school sectors to achieve our shared goal of world-class school leadership techniques. We want the professional development across the profession to be highly regarded and widely used. It underpins an effective learning environment. There needs to be just as much emphasis on principal and leadership quality as there is on general teacher quality. And we need to address what impediments school leaders face that prevent them from getting on with their prime job of providing quality education for their students by providing effective leadership within their school communities. As I said last year, I am increasingly concerned that schools and teachers have become the first stop to respond to every new social concern, to solve every new perceived problem and to take on whatever the latest fad or concern may be. We must allow principals and teachers the time, space and professional independence to focus on the primary purpose of education, to equip young people with the skills and knowledge they need to successfully transition to further education or training or into the workforce as worthwhile, active and responsible citizens. I want to close by saying that our government believes having a quality teacher workforce is not only essential to a quality education system, but is essential to Australia's successful economic transformation as a nation. Identifying and supporting highly accomplished teachers like yourselves must be a priority if the status and value of the teaching profession is to be enhanced. I know the highly accomplished and lead teacher network will help to drive improved outcomes for students and you are leading the way in your profession through your participation. You are part of a network that will inspire, will mentor and influence beginning teachers and the existing teacher workforce to improve practice and expertise. As the Federal Minister, there are a number of important directions that we must take this network in. Ideally, Australia needs a consistent way for teachers to be recognised, rewarded and remunerated for their skill, expertise and professionalism. We need strong and effective links between the standards, teacher registration requirements, quality professional learning, performance appraisal and career progression. Great teachers should be identified, supported to mentor other teachers and remunerated accordingly. I would like to see all states join up to the HALT process, especially the certification arrangements. At present, certification is only offered in the ACT, New South Wales, Northern Territory, South Australia and some independent schools in WA. In a nation like Australia, we should be working and we certainly will as a government be working to ensure everyone has access to this great program so that it can be further expanded so that more students can have access to the best that the teaching profession has to offer. My own grandmother was a teacher with whom I lived for a number of years when I was young. I cite her as one of my greatest influences in having that passion and interest in current affairs and public policy. Of course, that is what led me ultimately uh, to an interest in politics and to where I find myself today. I am passionate about the status of your profession. I know way back when Nan started out as a teacher, it was one of the great highly regarded professions. I believe it still is today, it certainly should be, and through this network I have great confidence that we can make sure that is a view widely shared across Australia. Thanks so much for your participation and all the best for your deliberations. Thank you, Minister. Uh, much appreciated.
Would you like some questions? I'm happy to take That'd questions. be great. We'll Fabulous. get some microphones. <laughs> All right, questions uh, for the minister. Come on, we can't have a, a group of shy, highly accomplished <laughs> yeah. uh, lead teachers. That's not even possible. What do we got? There we go. Uh, I'm just curious as uh, to how you think we might make this a national process. So we, you've uh, listed the states that are involved, and obviously we know that in the room who's there, but I'm just interested in how we get Queensland, Victoria, uh, Tasmania on board. And, all and of the rest WA. of WA, et cetera. Yes. Um, look, I think, uh, I think today will be a great start. Today and tomorrow will be a great start because it will um, empower me to be able to take some of your successes uh, to my state and territory colleagues. And, uh, and I would hope that by year's end, we're really able to report back to the Ministerial Council and to demonstrate the advances that are being made uh, in the jurisdictions uh, where the network has been adopted and where certification has been adopted, and from that to really be able to encourage the others to come through on board. It obviously is, I guess, a shared process in terms of um, applying the pressure points to get the different jurisdictions uh, and other sectors to come on board. So you as teachers have your professional networks uh, that you can make sure across those state borders you're actually having um, the bottom up, if you like, um, voice heard uh, to government departments and ultimately to state and territory ministers. And you can certainly take it from me as the federal minister uh, that should I be there later this year, in this wonderful election year that we have, um, that I will certainly be taking your outcomes, your deliberations here in success and emphasising that to those state and territory ministers and governments that, uh, that we think they should be getting on board too. Right? That's it. Other questions? Yep. You're going to have to watch table seven. They're the ones yeah. with all the questions. <laughs> that you plan to have research on effective practices. I was wondering if that's already a commitment or if you will lobby to get funding for that. Research, uh, research funding, I guess, comes in a, uh, comes in a number, of, uh, number of different ways. Now, we've already committed, as I said, research through AITSL to implement uh, a number of the recommendations. Uh, and so that funding through AITSL is certainly supporting um, some examination uh, across um, effective practices and how programs can best work. Uh, but of course, we also have much broader, consistent research streams that we provide through the Australian Research Council and elsewhere uh, that I fully expect should be ensuring our university academics involved in the teaching uh, of teachers and in the research of best practice learning and teaching outcomes uh, have those avenues in which uh, they can and should in an almost continuous way be, be examining the effectiveness uh, of uh, different practices across different areas of, uh, of learning, recognising that, of course, to simply say, I mean, there's, there's the question at a holistic level of what makes a great teacher, uh, but then there are other questions of what makes a great maths teacher versus what makes a great art teacher. And, uh, and indeed, while some of the attributes will be the same, it won't just be the skill knowledge that perhaps needs to differ in those cases. Some of those attributes will differ. Now, we'll start at least with the big picture of the common ground, but I hope that we can certainly uh, see in time that there's also a greater appreciation of the expertise required across different parts of the profession as well. Yes, I got... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm getting beat with the paint on. <laughs> Many of us that support early career teachers recognise that um, quite often they're not well prepared when they come into schools. And many of us recognise that they, it would be more ideal for them to have more experiences in schools. Mm -hmm. And in our case, in my school, as with many schools across the country, that concern is expressed locally and we've built relationships. We've actually taken ourselves as an executive to Newcastle University and we have an arrangement where we have been at next year, next week. In fact, we've got a whole lot of first year students coming into the school. So that's at a grassroots level, that initiative. And I was wondering nationally what sort of pressure you can apply at, at a university sector, pressure or, and or funding, to support universities to actually manage that. Because they want to give their students more experience, but it's just not happening. 
look, and I think that is um, a critical area. If you look at, you know, my wife's an accountant. Um, she graduated with an accounting degree and then went on to become a certified accountant. But the process to become a certified accountant took place outside of the university. It was about learning from other professionals with experience in the profession. It occurred while she was in the workplace and did provide, in essence, of course, that ultimate um, um, professional year and professional experience before she then had a qualification that was more broadly recognised across her profession. So I think in terms of graduates in an area like teaching, that professional exposure to other teachers, to the practical classroom environment is essential. Now, TMAG provides some recommendations that strengthen that uh, to some extent, and certainly I've met already with the deans of education uh, across our universities to talk about what I see as the importance there. They tell me that sometimes they have challenges in successfully placing their students in schools, uh, and so there's obviously a marrying up process that we need to focus on there. But I would really value um, the views of this organisation about what you think the ideal and optimal arrangements for initial teacher graduates are as to how they step into the profession. Uh, and of course, we're putting a real direction there that we expect mentoring activities to be a key part of what we hope that lead teachers will undertake. Uh, and actually then saying back to government, well, okay, is the amount of time in the classroom with established teachers adequate through the initial teacher education program? Not just adequate in its totality, but adequate in terms of the duration of an individual lump sum. Would we be better off having perhaps fewer incursions, but those that are of longer duration uh, out of the university and into the school environment in the classroom. Um, is there more that we should be doing in the first year out of university uh, that provides a more structured professional year uh, type operation before somebody has that full recognition as a registered teacher and is able to uh, fly solo as such? So um, without wanting to put it all back on you, but knowing equally this is part of what you'll be uh, discussing tomorrow, I want to emphasise that I see, I guess, having picked up this process post the completion of the TMAG report, and whilst a lot of that is underway, and now as a minister thinking, OK, well, what comes next, uh, that I'm very conscious of thinking about um, that practical component, perhaps that also comes from having been the minister responsible for vocational education and training immediately coming into this role, where, of course, there is a real expectation of workplace learning complementing uh, other structured learning. Probably yep, time for yep. one more. One more, yep. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, this is slightly off topic, but I was wondering <laughs> if you could comment on the funding disparity for South Australian Year 7 students. So it, it is an issue here in South Australia, and it does get bounced back and forth between federal and state governments about this issue. I was wondering if you have a take or a position on that. Sure. Thank, thank you. And look, for, for those from the rest of the country, um, <laughs> South Australia is, uh, is the remaining jurisdiction that has not transitioned Year 7 uh, into um, secondary school settings. And the funding arrangements as they apply for, in terms of the way funding is structured under the Australian Education Act that flows through to um, states and territories is that we have um, base funding for primary school students and base funding for secondary school students. And that is determined on the basis of what a state defines them as. So we do have a situation where year seven students in South Australia effectively are being funded less uh, than others. Now the recognition, you know, the view behind that I guess is that in a secondary school setting, those year seven students are getting um, a more diverse teaching offering in terms of more expert teachers uh, and theoretically the costs of delivery are more than the costs of delivery in the primary school setting. That's getting more complicated here in my home state uh, because uh, uh, the Lutheran sector has already moved their year seven students into a secondary stream. The Catholic sector is talking about doing the same. The state government is continuing to resist. But you can rest assured that and many independent schools have already done the same or already operate in an R to 12 context anyway and have students in a middle school environment. 
So you can be confident, I guess, as the local minister, I'm well aware of the problem and that those who have shifted or are talking about shifting, their students are knocking on my door saying, well, we are now incurring the additional costs of having those students embedded in a secondary school environment with more specialist teachers and some of those extra costs. So are you going to help us, uh, given it's only the state government definition that holds us up? I'm looking at it. I don't yet have a clear answer as to what the pathway through for me is, whether it requires legislative change or whether there are other mechanisms that can be done, uh, but I do understand that. And look, you've all been terribly polite uh, in terms of both hearing me out today, <laughs> but also the fact that that niche funding question was, uh, was the only funding question. Um, there's, <laughs> I said, terribly polite. <laughs> Um, I, I want to say one thing as, uh, as I wrap up, and I understand that funding does matter. Now, I keep saying what people do with funding, of course, matters even more, and I stand by that, and I don't want to have a, a lengthy debate, not least because I've got a teleconference to join in a few minutes, but having had funding raised, uh, there's one point that I do want to emphasise, because there's a fair degree of misinformation that sometimes is spread in that frustrating political debate I alluded to at the outset. That is that from a federal government level, School funding is at a record level. It's forecast to keep growing. No matter who is elected, it's forecast to keep growing. Now, I'm not going to mislead you. My political opponents are promising far greater rates of growth than we are necessarily promising. But I often hear discussion of cuts and I sometimes get questions from genuinely concerned teachers and school leaders saying, well, we've had extra money flow into our school in recent years and we're really worried that that we won't be able to keep doing those things under the cuts that are forecast. What I, the message I just want to emphasise is a point of reassurance, and you'll all have your views about the funding debates generally, but as a point of reassurance is funding's promised to keep growing. If your school has managed to do different things and additional things in recent years, that's the baseline off of which we're growing, no matter who's elected. So the opportunity to keep doing things won't actually be removed from schools. Of course, happily, I'm um, no doubt we'll have other opportunities to debate what additional arguments there are, uh, but I do just want to provide that reassurance because each time I hear the word cuts, I know that there are those who fear that what they're currently doing today is at risk, and that's certainly not the case. That is not the case. It's about the trajectory of growth into the future uh, around school funding um, rather than actually uh, any sense of reduction. But on that slightly controversial and political note, um, I do need to, to wrap up. Um, so thank you all very much uh, again for your attention uh, and participation. And I really do look forward to hearing from Marjorie and John and the Aitzel team uh, about the outcomes of uh, uh, these couple of days. Thank you.